The Trump campaign is desperate to distance the former president from Project 2025, and his running mate has said Donald Trump speaks for himself. So here's what Trump himself said at his press conference today on just one issue, the issue of abortion access. Would you direct your FDA, for example, to revoke access to mifeprestone? That's one of the things so that's you been could, discussed. So you could do things that will be, would, would supplement, absolutely. And those things are pretty uh, open and uh, humane. But you have to be able to have a vote. And all I want to do is give everybody a vote. And the votes are taking place right now as we speak. And that's yeah. something you would consider? But it's a very good, there are many things on a humane basis that you can do outside of that. Now, here is what Project 2025 has proposed on this. Quote, the Food and Drug Administration is ethically and legally obliged to revisit and withdraw its initial approval of abortion drugs like mifepristone. Let's discuss this and more with former Democratic Senator Bob Torricelli of New Jersey and Tim Miller, Hope of the Bulwark podcast and the former communications director for Republican Jeb Bush. Tim, it's been widely reported that Donald Trump was briefed by the Heritage Foundation president on Project 2025. He was on a flight with the president of 2025. He's very closely aligned with the Heritage Foundation. So how does the campaign think it can keep saying, Donald Trump, he didn't know anything about it. It's just not true. Yeah. Well, and one of the guys that was uh, a main player in a Johnny McEntee was called the deputy president uh, in the last year of the presidency and was kind of behind a lot of the staffing moves that prepared them for January 6th, moving people aside and getting more cronies in there. Uh, and then you have J.D. Vance wrote the forward to the book for Kevin Roberts, uh, which is upcoming. Uh, Kevin Roberts, the head of the Heritage Foundation that ran Project 2025. Literally, the forward of the book was written by J.D. Vance, not a blurb, the forward. So, you know, look, these guys are tied to it. Um, the key the key point here that they are um, eliding uh, is that it's sure it's kind of true that Donald Trump speaks for himself when Donald Trump doesn't think deeply about policy and he just words, word vomits, et cetera. But the people that would work in a second Trump administration are the people that are working on Project 2025. And, and they are the ones that will staff the agencies. And that is the scariest part about Project 2025. And if Donald Trump actually wanted to distance himself from Project 2025, he would say, I'm not gonna hire a single person that was involved with this project. But he's not gonna do that because those are the loyalists that he's going to want and need in the next administration. And so I, that you know, really is, I think, the fact that reveals how, how absurd it is that they're trying to distance from it. Bob, what is so stunning is if the contents of Project 2025 were so offensive, were so off-putting to voters, why on earth would they publish this thing? But now they have. So are Democrats doing the right thing, hammering this and trying to educate people with what's actually in it? Well, first, I've, I've seen this so many times in campaigns. You know, God help you from your own allies. Uh, they'll cause you problems every, every time. It is the difference between ideologues in a political campaign and the practical politicians who are trying to win elections. And you're seeing that classic conflict. I'm not sure in the end this brings any political mileage to the Harris campaign, though. The only arbiter of what the candidate believes in and what he embraces is the candidate himself. So people can have fun with this, but I'm not sure it has any, in the end of the day, any electoral value. Were I in the Congress, I would be watching for some of the people who were authors of some of these statements as they seek to populate another Trump administration, if it, if it happens. That I would do. But the rest of it, I'm not sure it has political value over time. Well, then let's talk about Kamala Harris's campaign, Senator, because I think it's fair to say the last time you and I spoke, you were worried about President Biden's chances. You were concerned that America was forgetting what it was like to have Donald Trump as a president. Well, now we see who Donald Trump is. We're reminded with press conferences like the one we got today. And now we've got a new candidate in VP Harris. How are you feeling now? You know, the, the, I feel that the, the political world is spinning so fast. It, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to get your footing. Uh, Donald Trump today was clearly frustrated. I understand that. Two weeks ago, he would have been entitled to be measuring the drapes in the White House he was headed for a significant victory. Now he's in a race. And I, I think it's a real race. And I think it's a close race. Uh, I, I would not 
yet, as a Democrat, come to the view, however, that uh, there's a there's an advantage in this in this campaign. Uh, the vice president has had 11 days of, uh, of extraordinary press. The rollout has been near perfect. It had it been planned for six months, it couldn't have gone any better. And that has brought her even in the campaign. I, I, I think we all need to remind ourselves that the issues that brought Donald Trump to have a significant advantage over uh, President Biden before the debate, he was winning before the debate, those issues are still there. Uh, the vice president's got to get past the hemorrhaging situation at the, the border, the mismanagement of it, the economic circumstances, particularly the feeling of responsibility for inflation and what is a rapidly deteriorating international situation. I know Joe Biden feels great uh, pride in how he's managed international affairs, but from the view of most analysts, including American voters, at, at the moment, it doesn't look very good. But what about all the new voters? What about the young voters, those, those who were considered double haters months ago, who weren't inspired or excited about voting for Joe Biden or Donald Trump? We're suddenly seeing, Bob, this huge surge of new voters, people registering to vote, people saying, yes, I've got something to get behind. Those are people yeah, I think who, that's why who weren't even thinking I think, about four months ago. Yeah, no, but, but, for that, I, but for that, I think we'd be talking about this race in very different contexts. She is going to expand the base of the party and bring entirely new people in to vote. But, I, you know, I'm reminded, after Hillary lost, I, I spoke with her, and she asked me when I, I thought they were in trouble. And I said, Hillary, I was driving from a place where I spend summers in Maine, and I noticed in the couple hours as I came through rural Maine, people were going out to their mailboxes and with crayons and paper writing Trump and nailing it to a tree. In 20 years of running for federal office, I'd like to believe it were not so, but I don't think anyone ever walked to a mailbox, wrote my name on a piece of paper and nailed it to a tree. So yes, the, the vice president is in this race and has a chance to win it because she is going to broaden the base with all the voters that you discussed. On the other hand, there's also an enormous pool of very disaffected people out there rural and otherwise, who made Donald Trump president before against all odds. And I, I think that base may equally expand. This is a real race. Sure. We should remind our audience, though, that even in that first election, more Americans voted for Hillary Clinton. And then, of course, Joe Biden won the next election. Tim, do you want to respond to Bob's thoughts? Uh, I love a reality check from the torch. I'm just honored to be on with him. Uh, I, I'm a little <laughs> bit more bullish than him. I'm usually the rain clouds. This is a great, uh, great spot for me. Uh, I, I, look, I think that there's a lot of uh, energy right now behind Kamala. Um, and I think that he, she is bringing new people into the process. Uh, we've seen, you know, I think it was something like 30 percent of Democrats were excited to vote. Uh, before the debate, uh, since Kamala has uh, ascended to the top of the ticket, now that number is closer to 90. So just, a, you know, the uh, the excitement gap uh, between the two candidates is completely uh, narrowed. So, uh, look, I don't think that she has a slam dunk race ahead of her, but I, I think that she is expanding uh, the uh, electorate. I don't really think that Donald Trump is. I guess I disagree with that. Um, but I, I don't know that as many people are going to turn out this time. But I, I just think that if you look at the the groups that you mentioned in one of your questions uh, to to Senator, uh, you know, the double haters, uh, we're seeing so much fewer of those now. And we have this unprecedented number of so-called double haters we talked about all year. And now if you look at the polls, like those numbers are very small. RFK's numbers are very small. Um, you know, this is, is trending to a much more traditional race like what we saw in, tw in 2020, which President Biden won narrowly. And I think that, that that's kind of what Kamala Harris should be looking towards um, if she can continue kind of the momentum we've seen in the first two weeks. As Jim Carrey once famously said, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs>